Psychotoxicology and Environmental Stress Lab is an interdisciplinary research group and we're focused on stressors such as, such as microplastics and nanoplastics, pesticides, and other contaminants of emerging concern. And we seek to understand mechanistically how these different stressors are impacting wildlife. And we also seek to make connections to human health concerns. We work with regulatory agencies on mitigating impacts through science-based solutions and also sometimes even through policy change. Our main focus is on the effects of chemical stressors on aquatic organisms, but we also think about this in the context of climate change. And with our micro and nanoplastics work, we've also expanded a bit into the terrestrial realm, thinking about impacts on our food supply, on things like wastewater and biosolids, as well as thinking about ways to reduce how many microplastics and microfibers are getting into the environment in the first place. Different organisms have different exposures to plastics, so it's not that they have different toxicity, it's just where they're at in the water column and whether those plastic particles remain suspended or whether they fall out into the sediment, in which case sedimentary organisms would be more exposed. Some of those that would float to the surface, maybe more surface dwelling organisms would be exposed. So it's really more about the exposure than the toxicity. Different plastics have different effects. And so trying to understand whether it's the plastic particle, whether it's the chemical that's associated with them, or a chemical that they pick up in the environment is causing the toxicity is, is really important and I think understudied as well. So from the cryo mill, we generate these powders from everyday consumer products. This is a polypropylene straw, so a traditional plastic straw. If you add those in water, you can see they, they don't like to be in water. They're climbing right up the side. If you add some organic matter in there, though, you can see that they stay way more stabilized and your exposure is going to be much more stable. This is microplastics, so these are polypropylene straws broken down to the micro scale. So you can still see the particles in there. If they're milled down to the nano scale, this is what they look like. So you can see there's nothing in there. One of the main ways that we analyze microplastics is by morphology. So you look at the color and the shape. It won't give you the chemical makeup of the particle, but it does let you know how many are in the environment. Our most important instrument is the FTIR, that is our Fourier Transform Infrared Scope. That is where we put the particles into the scope, we shoot a beam of IR energy down, it reflects off the particle and back into the machine. Based on the amount of IR energy that was absorbed or reflected, then we can match that up to chemical IDs and see exactly what our particle is. My research studies microplastics in a coastal food web. Specifically, we're looking at the gray whale food web where we found that uh, gray whales can consume up to 20 million microplastics per day from their prey alone. We don't know the impacts of microfibers on these systems yet. I mean, that's part of what I'm starting to look at. In the lab, we use organisms like silvercides and, and mycids and perform these standard toxicity tests where we expose them to microfibers, to tire particles, and we're uh, beginning to see impacts on things like their growth and behavior, and hopefully that can give us some insight into what kind of effects eventually it has all the way up in these larger systems. My research shows for toxicity testing that if the pesticides are impacting their behavior, then that can be problematic because maybe if they're displaying more boldness because of an introduction of the pesticide, then they potentially could be affected at the population level due to an inability to avoid predators, and then that could impact their survival along with just the pesticides potentially affecting their behavior and movement or their social interactions or feeding behavior. The way our brew stock system works is we purchase animals, whether that be silver sides or mycid shrimps, and we usually get them at somewhat of a younger stage, not always larval, but younger. And then we'll raise them up to there at a size and age where they're spawning. And then from there, with the fish specifically, we'll put in, the researchers will put in strands of organic wool yarn and the fish swim through these to deposit their embryos. After 24 hours, we come in, we'll pull the strands and have somebody manually collect all of the embryos off of those strands. Variety of species is important because a lot of times 
what we're testing is like efficacy of, of a pesticide and for it to be approved by the EPA during their inspections we have to show that it is not only does what we want it to do but it's safe to non to what we call non-target species. If we're going to really reduce the exposure of wildlife and humans to harmful chemicals to harmful particles such as those generated by plastic products we need to have a diversity of approaches and we need to come up with an approach that isn't just evaluating and eliminating one chemical at a time only to replace it with something that might be equally harmful. I think the future of the lab looks much like, you know, a lot of the work we've been doing thus far. Of course, we're going to keep responding to new problems, to new questions, just like we have with the challenge of microplastics and nanoplastics and microfibers. Um, I think we could probably spend the rest of my career working on those questions easily. It's a, a wicked problem that won't be solved overnight. So we'll continue asking and trying to answer the hard questions and striving to connect our findings to science-based, science-informed changes in regulation, changes in policy that will hopefully lead to better environmental protection.